Welcome everyone. In the last video on Muhammad's skin color and the sad state of Islamic history, I said we're going to try to peer back through the Abbasid revision into the early years of the history of Islam. Let's try to do that by looking at evidence that isn't so easily rewritten, namely inscriptions and coinage. Let's start with a hadith. The Messenger of Allah said, I have been ordered to fight the people until they say La ilaha illallah. And when I first read this hadith, I thought this is just a shorthand way of referring to the rest of the Shahada. Everyone knows the Shahada is the second part about Muhammad being a messenger and so forth. And so this initial part, La ilaha illallah, is just to cue in the reader's mind the rest of the Shahada as well. What if that's a bad assumption? Has there always been one Shahada? Has Muhammad always been a part of the Shahada? These are questions we're going to look at and more in this video. We're going to start with Stuart Sears. Previous declarations of faith, and we're going to refer to the Shahada as a declaration of faith throughout this video, such as those on early Muslim coins emphasize beliefs common to most or all religious traditions. They could be Jewish, Christian, Zoroastrian, or even polytheist. The first mention of Muhammad's messengership, and in fact his name, comes from coinage struck in Iran in 66 H, that is 685 to 86 CE. It reads, in the name of God, Muhammad is the messenger of God. So it took about 50 years for Muslim coinage to evolve out of these sort of generic affirmations of faith into something specific to Islam, including the name of Muhammad. But there is some variation. Let's go to an Egyptian inscription that we find on a tombstone. This tombstone is dated to about 71 AH, that is about 690 to 91 CE, and it asserts there is no God but God alone. He has no partner. Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. So we have two different affirmations of faith so far. In the name of God, Muhammad is the messenger of God. There is no God but God alone. He has no partner. Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. But we're not going to stop at just two affirmations. We're going to add a lot more. So to keep all of this organized, we're going to use categories or labels for each one of these affirmations of faith. And for this, we're going to adopt Professor Bakarek's terminology. The Egyptian version, we're going to cleverly refer to as the Egyptian version. And this is the one we just saw on a tombstone. And the short version only contains the words Bismillah Muhammad Rasulullah, and they appear on coinage in Iraq and Iran. So within these categories, we can already see that we have the Egyptian and the short version. Now there is a question mark right here by the phrase in the name of God because there are about nine lines of text on the inscription between that and the rest of the affirmation of faith. So it's not immediately clear if these belong together or not. Now let's look at the Eastern version. This one's actually a bit odd. Arab Sasanian coins dating to the early 70s AH, about 689 to 90 CE, were inscribed on the obverse, that is the front of the coin as opposed to the reverse, which is the rear, the front outer margin in the second and third quadrants with, in the name of God, there is no God except God alone. And the center of the obverse, again, that's the front, field included the phrase, Muhammad Rasulullah, catch this, on the right side of the image of Khosrow. We can actually take a look at this coin. There's Khosrow's image and, of course, the inscription that Professor Bakarek's referring to, to the right of the image. Now you say, isn't that a little bit odd given the view of uh, Islam on images, especially to have Muhammad's name inscribed right next to the image of a foreign ruler? Well, yeah, it's, it's a bit odd, and we'll talk more about images later. But for now, we're up to three versions of the affirmation of faith. We have the Egyptian version, we have the short version, and we just looked at the Eastern version, once again with Muhammad's name being inscribed next to an image. And we get more curious features in the Jerusalem version of the Shahada. Prophet Muhammad and his messengership are often not integral elements in these declarations. The Dome of the Rock omits mention of him, but invokes his name separately in appeals for his intercession on the Day of Judgment. There are five inscriptions from the Dome of the Rock that scholars have used to try to reconstruct the Shahada, and here they are. They all begin with a full bismillah, in the name of God the Magnificent, the Merciful. And there are breaks between several of these with various Quranic excerpts or pious phrases before you get to Muhammad is the Messenger of God. So you see that occurs in number one, number four, and the fifth inscription as well. 
So if we consider Muhammad as part of the Jerusalem Shahada, then we end up with possibly a more long-winded version. In the name of God the Magnificent, the Merciful, there is no God except God alone. He has no partner. Muhammad is the Messenger of God. It's truly a mouthful. We do have more inscriptions that confirm this. When Abdul Malik built a road from Jerusalem to Damascus, he erected stone slabs along the way, and they all had inscriptions that matched something like what we see in Jerusalem. So perhaps Abdul Malik fixed the formula of the affirmation of faith during his rule. And for keeping track, we're up to four versions now. We just covered the Jerusalem version, and you'll notice that the Syrian version has yet to be explored. We've seen a couple of differences so far. The minor difference is that the opening phrase has been reduced in the Eastern version to just in the name of Allah. The more important difference is that in contrast to the Jerusalem and Egyptian versions, the Eastern text does not include the phrase, he has no partner. Now, one way to account for the differences in these affirmations is to look at the competing worldviews of Abdul Malik's time. For example, he may want to distance himself from the Karajite movement, so he would subtract a phrase that perhaps they used in their affirmation of faith as well, to distance himself and his followers from the Karajites. Alternatively, if he wanted to launch a polemic against his understanding of Christianity, he could add a phrase something like, God has no partner. Now, there are some other interesting features of Abdul Malik's coinage as well. We see something here similar to what we saw in the Jerusalem inscriptions, where Muhammad's name is not given quite the prominence that we would expect. Stuart Sear says the dinars and dirhams introduced by Abdul Malik in the late 70s AH are similar. The formula, there is no God but God alone, he has no partner, appears in the obverse fields. Muhammad is mentioned less conspicuously on the front of one and the reverse of the other. Now that is truly very odd. Imagine in modern day Muhammad's name not given any more prominence than on the back of the Shahada coin, so to speak. Now we've seen a couple of odd features about these coins. We saw Muhammad's name inscribed to the right of an image. Very curious. There are also other coins with images of the caliphs on them. Perhaps you've seen some of these. There's the caliph standing armed. Now surprisingly, we don't have any recorded objections whatsoever by the early Muslims to these images. We don't have any objections to Muhammad's name being inscribed next to an image. What's surprising is that the objections come later when the coins which contained images were phased out by Abdul Malik and he minted all epigraphic coins, coins with all inscriptions. Now the problem was that some of these inscriptions contained verses from the Quran or at least parts of verses. So here's the problem. You have people handling coins with text from the Quran with impure hands. And this is where Abdul Malik started encountering objections from people under his rule. But it's not that simple. It's actually really dangerous because coins were a way of a caliph disseminating his propaganda as they were for all rulers of that time. And if you protest, especially publicly, against what the caliph is minting in these coins, if you protest against the message that goes along with them, you're being insubordinate, and you do not want to be insubordinate to a caliph. That's a very risky thing indeed. Now, there are some other curious features about these all epigraphic coins, and from these features, we see the differences and the similarities, and in doing so, we finally uncover the Syrian version of the Shahada. Professor Bakrick notes some differences for us. The center and most important inscription does not contain either the short or long form of in the name of Allah. There is no God except God alone was moved to the obverse center as opposed to the margins. So that statement became more important. Again, it's in the front center of the coin. Breaking a six-year tradition on gold and silver coins, the phrase Muhammad is the prophet of God is no longer on the third line. Instead, it is Allah has no partner. So Muhammad surprisingly has been marginalized in this version. Professor Bakarik says it would have been possible to include in the center field the phrase Muhammad Rasul Allah either by squeezing four lines into the center of the obverse or by writing the previous phrases in two lines and making the last line Muhammad Rasul Allah. However, none of this was done. The central and most important message on the front was therefore that which emphasized God's unity 
and rejected the concept of the Trinity through the inclusion of the phrase, he has no partner. Professor Bacharach continues, there is another implication of having the location of the marginal legends on the Durham, the reverse of those on the Dinar, namely, that one cannot assume that the center and marginal text are to be read as a single message. So are these two phrases different, or are they part of one affirmation of faith? Both the earlier Jerusalem affirmation of faith, as found in the Dome of the Rock, and the Eastern version, which was used on coinage from age 72 on, were changed. There is no Bissam Allah in the beginning, and the phrase Muhammad Rasulullah is not connected to the rest of the words as a single text. Now, as we saw in the previous video, there were some major changes in the Islamic world and some rewriting of the past when the Abbasids came to power. Even the role of Muhammad as prophet was marginalized. It would not be inscribed in the center of Muslim coinage until the Abbasids came to power, when it was part of their ideological position to identify themselves as descendants of the family of the prophet. Assuming these somewhat disconnected phrases are supposed to be connected, for the Syrian version we get something like, there is no God except God alone, he has no partner, Muhammad is the prophet of God. But again, this is a reconstruction from what could be disconnected phrases. This is why Professor Bacharach says, therefore it is not clear from the existing numismatic and architectural data which phrases constituted the Shahada in the 70s. So we have five different versions. Once again, question marks in the appropriate places. Remember the disconnect in the text with the Egyptian version and the Syrian version. We are attempting to reconstruct that through a series of apparently disconnected phrases. So in summary, we saw that Muhammad evolved into the affirmation of faith after several decades of generic statements that were appropriate for just about any of the surrounding religions. We saw variation in these phrases. We saw, surprisingly, Muhammad's name inscribed next to an image. We also saw Muhammad's prominence in these formulaic statements varied. And once again, with the rise of the Abbasids, some major changes came to the Islamic world. Now, if you ask Muslims how many shahadas there are, how many shahadas there have been throughout Islamic history, the answer would be one. There's one shahada. I've seen this in local mosques. You say the one shahada, one specific way, in one specific language, and you have to do this in order for it to be valid. The imam helps uh, these would-be Muslims struggle through each syllable in Arabic. It has to be said just so. Many Muslims would be surprised to know that there's actually significant variation in the early affirmations of faith. And there's also variation in the prominence that Muhammad is given in them. Muhammad is apparently not uh, figured right in with Allah, on par with Allah like he is in so many ways in the modern Islamic faith. I think that one thing this teaches us is that the early history of Islam looks nothing like what tradition tells us. It looks nothing like what Muslims have been traditionally taught. And I would simply encourage Muslims to dig in to their history with very valuable bits of evidence like this, inscriptions, things that aren't changed so easily by later historical revisions. It's difficult to erase an inscription. It's difficult to uh, change a text on a coin. So these give us rather objective views back into the early history of Islam, back through the Abbasid revolution. And let us see, even with one of these five pillars of the Islamic religion, that things have not always been the way they seem. The more Muslims dig into this type of thing, the closer they'll get to the truth. I hope this video encourages them to do that. I'll see you next time.